Uh, okay, I'd now like to welcome to the podcast, and this is something that's very surreal, and I cannot wait to rub this into the faces of my media studies teachers at school, my film studies teachers at college, and all my friends who keep calling me a liar. Uh, the legendary Stephen D'Souza. Mr. D'Souza, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, this uh, fine California morning, uh, which I guess is a, uh, a guess is uh, supper time in Ireland. Yeah, it's uh, it's and it's absolutely pissing down rain. So uh, I'm genuinely envious right now. Oh, I don't want to tell you then how nice the weather is here. Okay, it's it, it's horrible. In fact, there's a forest fire. It's coming closer. I may have to I may have to get off the call here. It's just it's just a block away. The forest fire. Well, <clears throat> I'm speaking of actually actually two weeks ago there was there was I, there was evacuation that was just ended. Um, not even half a mile from here. Well, uh, speaking of, uh, well, I don't know what's speaking of. This is a really bad segue, but uh, the latest uh, scandal slash gossipy thing in the Hollywood world is uh, Martin Scorsese uh, dared, so, as they call it, to speak his opinion about a, a film series, the Marvel film world. This caused a bit of a backlash against him because these days you're not allowed to think what you want about popular stuff. So, uh, what was your take on the uh, the, the so called backlash against Scorsese speaking his mind? Well, I think that the backlash was a, uh, a little uh, overwrought. He uh, revised his comments the other day. Uh, basically, what he's saying is that these Marvel movies, not all of them, but most of them, that's me amending what he said, they don't take risks. Right? Yeah. Because it's sort of preordained that um, they have to keep the ball rolling. So I think I think if he had couched his remarks in saying um, film series, I mean, you could say, you could argue the same thing about any kind of film series, like uh, James Bond, for example. Like, we know that James Bond will never die in a movie. The ultimate stake. I think what he's, I think what he's saying, in, in inelegant terms, is there's a difference between drama and melodrama. Yeah. But that's probably, like, a little too sophisticated and too simple for an interview. Like, if I said that to you and left it at that, you go, oh, so... No, but the point is, is that uh, most of the motion picture business from the studios is frankly, in fact, not drama, it's melodrama. In that the definition of drama is a character rises and falls, the protagonist rises and falls, rises on his, on, uh, his or her own merits, and falls on his or her own flaws. That's a drama, the classical definition of a drama, and in a comedy, the protagonist... Uh, rise and they have a happy ending. Well, well of course, uh, in, in regards to Martin Scorsese, his new film is uh, The Irishman. No, yeah. it's not based on an amazing podcaster. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. based on a, on a gangster. Uh, it's got this very unique thing in that it's getting a short cinema release, but then it's going full time to streaming to uh, Netflix just before right. the end of the month. So uh, my question for you is, as a writer, director, producer, etc., uh, what's your take on the differences between streaming and actual cinema releases? All right, well, you can criticize the re the, the snapback to, to uh, uh, Scorsese, which I was waiting for somebody to do. He says, well, that's interesting coming from you because your latest picture is television. You could actually, you know, possibly say. Uh, but uh, what you have now is you have the, um, with the streaming services, if you're actually in the motion picture uh, business, you have a, um, you're at a crossroads uh, in that if you're making a motion picture and you're looking at who do I want to finance this movie, what studio am I going to, with a mainstream studio um, who will share profits with you, uh, you tell yourself, all right, I can go with this mainstream studio, they're going to pay me X amount of money now, um, uh, and then I'm going to share 
in this windfall of profits down the line. But the truth is, not every motion picture turns a profit. The studio will break even. The studio will make money. But the way bookkeeping is done, uh, profits are rare. I've done, I have an ongoing argument, fake argument with John Milius about who has, who has had more movies made. It's like dick measuring, only it's, you know, um, resume measuring. And we're tied to 22 movies, but we're both lying because each of us is counting a television movie project. Uh, but out of those 22 movies, according to the official Hollywood bookkeeping, only two of them ever showed a profit. So, for example, Die Hard has not shown a profit yet, according to the studio bookkeeping. And the reason is that when a studio makes a movie, the first thing they do is they borrow the money to make the movie. They don't take it out of the bank. So the first thing you have is the interest on the, on the movie that got made. So Die Hard was a relatively inexpensive movie. It was made, it's 30 years ago, it was mostly filmed uh, on the lot, on the studio lot. There's very few scenes that are in the real world. You know, on the studio lot, you control your hours, you control costs, you control everything except the weather. It's very efficient. Even the building was on the studio lot. So I think, I have to look it up, but I think, you know, I think it cost barely $30, $30 million. But the interest on $30 million, right, which they keep carrying forward, is still on there. Uh, the other move, so the two movies I had that showed pro that, that went into profits, one was Commando, which is a very cheap movie. The, the, the marching orders were, if you can make a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger, a studio executive met Arnold at a party, and, and this was after he had only really been seen in Terminator and uh, uh, Conan. And he said, I think this guy's charming, he's funny. Uh, if you can make a movie with him for $10 million, I'll greenlight it immediately. So the movie was made. Uh, uh, we did that. And uh, I went and told Arnold the story. He agreed to do the movie. Um, and uh, the, uh, the picture, uh, just before the picture started, uh, the producer, uh, Larry Gordon, who I'd previously worked with on 48 Hours, and I'd originally met him in the television business, uh, he got promoted to a studio executive. He was a producer on the lot, and they gave him a job in corporate. So because he had a job in corporate, he could not produce the movie because it'd be like double dipping. In other words, you're mad, in other words he, you have a job here, you're in charge of all the movies. So his associate producer, he had worked with for several years, whose name may be familiar to Joel Silver, he said, all right, Joel, you're going to produce this movie by yourself. So Joel said, great, what is my profit participation back end? And Larry Gordon said, that's very funny. You know, this is your first time up at bat. You're not <laughs> getting a profit participation. And then Schwarzenegger also tried to get a profit participation, but the studio knew he was desperate to work. He hadn't worked in almost two years because at this time he was seen as such a freak of nature who would cast him. In fact, when I pitched the, the movie of, 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 of Commando to him, I acted out the whole story for him. Uh, he, he, was, he thought for a moment and said, I like this picture. I'm not a robot from the future or a caveman from the past. I'm wearing clothes. I'm having a family. It's a part John Vink. I do this picture. I always break up my Arnold impression. So he was not given a back end. Because uh, the uh, a, uh, actors will get um, uh, box office gross. So if an actor is getting 10% of the box office gross, then then 90% is left, which is split between the studio and the theaters. Mm. So by the time you do it, and then the studio takes a 30% distribution fee for putting the movie in theaters, 30% of everything. So, um, the, so uh, the first few weeks the movie is out, um, it gets split up along those lines. Now, back in the day... When um, this whole industry started in the silent era, taking a 30% distribution fee to uh, send these giant cans of film all over the country. You've seen them. Oh, so, yeah. Obsolete now. Uh, and they had to go from one theater to another. And theoretically, if you were sending a movie to, uh, from um, California to New York, maybe uh, train robbers would stop it in the Arizona Territory, which was not a state yet. But... They don't ship the boxes around anymore, and take, they take a 30% distribution fee to put it on cable. But to put a 20th Century Fox movie on HBO, they don't have to deliver these big film cans anywhere. They send over like a, 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 like a master, like a, a HD, uh, it's a little bit big, it's about this big, the, um, 
what what a hot, what the kind of you know you know four K kind of thing would be in a, a container like this, yeah. and they can have somebody on a bicycle go like three blocks to HBO. So thirty percent distribution fee for that. So all these baked in numbers uh, eat in to the theatrical money. So you have to have this runaway hit to actually see profits. Now, that's not residuals. Writers, directors, actors, and editors now get residuals. So when something plays again on television, right, you get a check. Uh, there was a thing the other day. Um, uh, I'm trying to think who the actor is. Um, uh, it's a, there's a thing that we do. A lot of people on, on, on um, uh, social media who are in the business uh, have fun. We put up our lowest residual check. So I have a check for four cents for <laughs> Die Hard 2. It played like in Romania on television. You know, uh, but they add, but those but they add up. You know, uh, I've been making um, movies and television shows for like uh, thirty five years, so somewhere Night Rider is playing. So the residuals you always get, and those are policed by computers. There's they're totally honest. A motion a studio uh, will advertise. We just shipped twenty million copies of Toy Story. Uh, um, Disney just announced that they had 10 million people signed up for Disney Plus, the uh, streaming service. So those are real hard numbers. Uh, that, and so the residuals are based on that. They can't fudge the residuals. But the box office returns, you're a victim of this bookkeeping. And there's also the possibility that the kid that is uh, taking, that the girl who sells you your ticket in the movie theater is actually going to let her boyfriend in for free. Right? You can't police that. So there's this bleeding of the box office all the way down the line. And at the end of the day, the chances are the imaginary windfall of profits you're going to get, you're never going to see. So I know when I sign a contract and they're promising me whatever 5% of the gross, of the producer, of, this, uh, of the gross profits. There never is any gross. Almost yeah. The other movie I had that went into profit was The Flintstone, strangely enough which cost $40 million in 1994. And even though Steven Spielberg and John Goodman could get box office gross, the movie was so cheap to make because it was all filmed on the back lot. They couldn't go in the real world. There is no, you know, bedrock. And they all, except for one change of wardrobe, they all had one outfit. You know, it was so cartoony. So it was a very cheap movie. And at one time, for about five years, it was the highest grossing comedy of all time. It made like almost half a billion dollars around the world, so they couldn't hide the money on that. So because the Flintstones made so much money and cost so little, and because there were no gross players on Commando, I saw box office gross. I mean, basically those movies uh, put my kids through college, and you know maybe they'll, maybe they'll put their kids through college. I don't know. Uh, so uh, on the other hand, uh, when you work for a studio, a studio, they drive you crazy with uh, notes. They they're constantly on you. Every time you send pages in, they have suggestions. Studio notes are widely and deservedly mocked for being sort of predictable and always the same. Um, and then they're there on your casting. They're there when you're editing the movie. They're all over you. They panic. You know, like another movie, come, if you're doing a Western and another Western is, is announced, it's going to be coming out when your Western's coming out. They start rethinking what you're doing or they push your movie back. They're like a weather vane. Um, I did a picture with Eddie Murphy uh, that had a romance in it, and then he had a movie come out with the romance that failed, so they said take the romance out. Uh, there was a child in the movie. He had, this movie was in development so long. He had a movie that had kids in it, not even just for a moment, just for a moment, not like a child that's his niece in the script I had. And they said, oh, the audience doesn't want to see him with kids. Take out the kid. Now, the movie that failed with had kids was he was a, uh, a con man who was accidentally elected to Congress. And oh, uh, All right, well, so at one point, one of his constituents comes to him and says that the cell phone tower is giving children leukemia. Now, this is, of course, is an urban myth that, that power lines give people, like, cancer. You may have heard it. It started, it, it started I think, in, in Scandinavia. So that was the plot of the movie. So I said, no, people didn't like that movie because you showed all the bald kids, like in the hospital, that like he finally gets touched. So um, Netflix and Amazon, uh, they leave you completely alone. 
if you if you go to Netflix and say, all right, we're going to make your movie, you know, like uh, you're going to make your movie, uh, the Leprechaun Ninja, right? Well, no, fine, just run with it. They don't bother you at all. They say, here's the amount of money. Here it is. Here's your salaries. You're getting what you get paid. You're, you know, in, in Hollywood, you're in a guild, right? But you're never going to see any profits. That's all you're going to get. When we own it forever after that. So that's the trade-off, right? The, the fantasy of the jackpot versus the certainty. The fantasy of the jackpot uh, is the appeal of going with the mainstream studio. The appeal of going with the streamer is the creative freedom. So that's the trade-off. Uh, and there's also the other issue where people make a movie and the studio looks at it and do, and gets nervous about it and they just bail and they give they take the Netflix or Amazon that's happened a couple times too. Now the the one difference here is uh, Apple. Apple doesn't know what they want and people are being very frustrated working with Apple uh, because um, Apple canceled a bunch of projects that were well along because they were controversial and controversial. To Apple is like anything, like they're worse than Disney. Like uh, no politics, no violence, uh, no sex. So people are uh, people are, um, uh, are, are. I'm hearing like a lot of people are a little very unhappy with uh, the micromanagement they're getting in Amazon because the assumption is you don't get the micromanagement from streamers. Well, of course, uh, a studio film that you made your directorial uh, cinema debut anyway was uh, Street Fighter. Now, uh, at the time it came out, it didn't get the greatest reviews in the world, but now in 2019, people love Street Fighter. So uh, what's that like knowing that you've been proven right all along? Uh, well, I've been proven right a couple of times. I know when we did Commando, um, it got scathing reviews. But both Arnold and I were pretty certain that it would, in the long run it would, have a good, it would have a reputation, which it does now. People like it, and Rambo is, no, no one, Rambo is a joke. Uh, and I think that with both of these movies... Uh, both of these movies were aware they were basically comedies. They did not take themselves seriously. I remember at the time that Street Fighter came out. Um, now, Street Fighter, of course, had a a um, uh, a, a um, problem when it's coming out because the Japanese wanted to get a, an American star. And when they went, I mean, he's Belgian, but to them, you know. Uh, so the first thing I said, well, you know, he's his accent going to be strange for an American, and they go, what accent? Because they hear him, a Japanese actor dubs Van Damme. So they, you know, what they, what foreign countries do is they try and have the same actor dub everybody. So like the same actor dubs, dubs uh, Bruce Willis in France. One guy has done all his movies, so he always sounds the same. Uh, in Japan, Toshiro Mofuni, who was the, the, the star of all of uh, uh, those uh, Japanese pictures, he dubbed John Wayne. All of John Wayne's movies were done. So there's consistency there. So they just didn't understand that, that John claude had an accent. And also, they wanted a PG-13 movie because they wanted to sell toys. And it said Van Damme's audience is expecting an R. So there was a cognitive dissonance in this movie, which was advertised as kind of like a Van Damme movie, except it was kind of soft because it was going to sell toys. Uh, how was it working with uh, Van Damme at the time? Because we've all, well, he himself has said yeah. that he was going through some shit. Yeah. Uh, and you hear these stuff where, where in previous films where he's demanded a nude scene where he gets to show off his, his arse or his ass, shall I say? Uh, no, he, he, didn't, he, he did not ask for a nude scene uh, in our picture. Um, so um, anyway, my point was that uh, I remember the time that Street Fighter came out, there were some reviews that said, this movie is so stupid, it's accidentally funny. So how you could look at that movie and see some of the things that are said and that are set up and staged and think they're accidentally funny. You know, like, uh, you got paid? You know, or, or uh, quick, quick change the channel. channel. <laughs> yes. Or even when Van Damme, like, is, is, is when Van Damme sneaks into the uh, enemy headquarters uh, and he suddenly open, goes through a doorway and there's, like, you know, 85 guys with guns, and he's like, he just takes out a knife, and they back up, you know, and he goes, you know, he doesn't realize his army has, has appeared behind him. So, anyway, it was uh, deliberately funny. The, the biggest problem on that film was, um, the first problem was, they insisted on putting all their characters in. When I first went, got the job, I said, I said to the Japanese in translation, I said, name the seven dwarfs. 
Nobody could. Name the seven wonders. Nobody could. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I, I said, name the seven deadly sins. Nobody could remember all seven. I said, there, pe human beings are sort of hardwired to sort of, without, without scratch paper, you sort of lose, lose track after seven. And my point was, you have, you have 18, you have 19 characters. They can't all do the math. There's 100 minutes in the movie. The movie's going to be 100 minutes long, maybe 110 minutes long, with 20 characters. They're going to go by in the blink of an eye. So they said, okay, okay, we get that. Fine, fine. So I started out with my first draft with, I think, about nine characters. You know, split between the good guys and the bad guys. But each time I would turn a draft in, or each time we would do the budget of the movie and we discover we were short, they would say, all right, we'll give you a little more money, but add another character. It was like a, a very kind of, you know, the Japanese they never say they never say no. They said, yes, well, you know, there's an old saying. So it was a kind of a Japanese negotiation. So uh, even, even after the movie started, they added characters. So um, that was problematic is that you're, you think it's a John claude Van Damme movie, but there's not a lot of John claude Van Damme in it, you know, compared to what you think you're getting. Uh, and also the uh, picture, you know, not being as rough as uh, one of his pictures uh, would be. Uh, so uh, my biggest problem on the film was um, they, uh, we had a hard release date. Uh, they, they knew the date the movie was coming out before we even started. And um, the production company made a deal with a uh, subcontractor, a production company in Thailand. So they bring me the schedule and they say, here's the schedule for the movie. It's a 10 week schedule. We're going to film, um, we're going to film, uh, six weeks in Thailand and four weeks at a studio in Australia. Now I, this is, I had started out in television and I worked my way up starting out on the $6 million man. And I worked my way up from a story editor on that show, which is the lowest producing job to executive producer of, of Knight Rider before I jumped into feature films. So when I was a producer of Knight Rider, um, I was responsible for about $35 million to make, uh, make you know, 22 Knight Riders. They cost like a million and one each at that time. So I know how to like, you know, I'm, I like to think I'm a creative sort, but I know how to read a budget. I know how to schedule a show. Otherwise, you know, it's, 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 it's like, uh, that's a whole different skill set. But I have it because I never would have become a television producer if I wasn't good at it. So I looked at the schedule right away and said, this is crazy. I wrote this script knowing I'm going to direct it, giving myself a break. And in my mind, when I wrote this script, it was like seven weeks on a soundstage and three weeks on location. Why are we doing this? And they said, well, the, the labor is so cheap uh, in um, Bangkok that you're going to get more production value. And we're only going to do the most difficult, difficult stuff with the most complicated sets like Bison's big command room and stuff. So we start filming in um, uh, Bangkok. And like from day one, things go wrong. So, for example, there's a location there. It was a wonderful location, which is supposed to be the, uh, the headquarters of the uh, Allied Nations. By the way, the reason it's not the United Nations is some idiot on the company asked the United Nations for permission to show them in the movie. So they said, no, whereas you don't need the permission to show them in a movie. You know what I mean? So we had to call it the AN, and, but nobody noticed. Every review said the United Nations. Even though all the signage says Allied Nations, they had the blue helmets. We did the logo the same way. Anyway, there's a big building. It's a famous scene that is beautifully parodied. Somebody put it on, on YouTube with subtitles. It's, it's Van Damme's speech to the troops. Yeah. It's a famous clip. He gives his very earnest speech. My fellow troopers. You've seen that clip. Oh, yeah. There's also one with subtitles. Have you seen that one? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah and they say, I'm going to kick that bison so hard. H-O-R-D, you know. All right, so anyway, that building is a great building. That building was a, uh, a Coast Guard command center on the river that had been uh, abandoned because they built a new headquarters. So it worked just for right for us. So they said to us, this is great because the big building, the big room inside that was the covered hangar for the Coast Guard boats, right? It's like, a, like almost like a submarine pen, right? That will be your main studio. 
You just shut the, shut the gates that go out to the river, and you can build your sets in there. So we go in there, and there's holes in the walls that light comes through. So when you would try and like you know control the lighting, it's like bullet holes in a movie when it's really cool, like your hero almost gets killed, and the bullet holes are there, and the light beams come in. You know what I mean? You see, but this was oh, yeah. where we didn't want that. It had a tin roof, and it was the rainy season. And when it rained, it was, you know, like so. We were almost, we were like, so we were, we were after two weeks in Thailand. We were like ten days behind schedule. Uh, and uh, also, the producer, uh, the line producer there was. Um, uh, was like sort of unavailable a lot. It turned out he was actually uh, thought he had he thought he had some kind of um, he thought he was coming down with something, and actually he he was actually having a slow a slow burning heart attack. So he was oh, sort of shit. like you know it was it, he, he it was sort of creeping up on him. He was lucky. Uh, so then we had to change a new and the new producer comes in and says you got to get out of Thailand. This is crazy because the whole time I was saying this schedule's crazy. Stephen, you've never directed a movie before, and I go. I produced uh, over a hundred hours of te television. I've directed Tales from the Crypt, which is like a very difficult show, special effect. You know, I know. What I'm, so finally, the new producer comes in and goes, "This guy was right. We're going to Australia right now." So we went to Australia earlier after th after uh, three weeks instead of after six weeks, and then we had to reshoot almost everything we had done in Bangkok. But we could not move the date of the release of the movie. So now it was a mad rush to get 10 weeks of movie done in seven weeks. Mm. It's a brutal schedule. And um, uh, John Claude, I guess maybe because, you know, he's a well-established star. And um, we had some, especially in, in Bangkok, some um, inexperienced people. Um, you know, who, uh, who, so he would say, uh, I want to go to Hong Kong for the weekend. Uh, Planet Hollywood is open. Fine, go. But you uh, have to be very careful about releasing somebody in case they don't come back. So he would leave Bangkok. He left twice to go to Hong Kong and somehow missed his flight back. So Monday morning, he wasn't there. So now what are we going to do? So I have to go, all right, um, I guess we'll do something else that wasn't scheduled for today. So now you're scrambling because now maybe those actors are sleeping late or yeah. that set hasn't been painted yet. You know, so it was it was uh, it was uh, very disorganized uh, and uh, uh, it was frustrating to me because the presumption is when you're the writer or director, you've got everything organized, you know, but um, you know, it, it, I was not able to do it. My biggest the biggest problem, though, was. Uh, when we started the movie out, we said, all right, what are we going to do here? Are we going to get martial artists and then hope they can act or get actors and train them to do martial art? So once we had Van Damme, that limited our budget. We had Van Damme and Raul Julia. They were, they, they were into star fucking. Can I say that on your radio show? On your oh, radio show, on, on your podcast. <laughs> I'm dating myself. I'm calling it radio. Um so uh, that left very little money for the rest of the cast, which is why everybody else was a, a, a rising star with most cases, except for Wes Studi. Uh, most of the other actors were like people were just breaking in, uh, which is fine. It's mostly a young cast. Uh, so we so after some discussion, we said, you know what? The way they fight in this movie from the video game is so unnatural. It bears like no resemblance to any actual real martial arts. I mean, with most, you know, in most circumstances, it's very wacky. Since it's so strange anyway, we, it, you know, the martial artists won't know it. We're going to have to teach them to do these wacky flips and tricks. So let's go with actors. So we cast the best actors we could find and afford for the picture. And we said, here's the plan. We're going to go to start the movie and we will front load all the dialogue scenes. And while we were shooting the dialogue scenes with actors A, B, C, and D, actors E, F, G, and H will be at the gym working with the stunt crew, learning the stunts. So after three or four weeks of people, actors talking, then we'll get to some of the stunts. And we'll keep this process going all the time. 
That was the plan. Um, my costume uh, wardrobe designer, Marilyn Vance, an Academy Award winning wardrobe designer, uh, she went on. She uh, was on a flight ahead of me to Australia, so I was waiting for um, a transfer. I guess where I was. I was in one airport waiting to go to the other airport, or I was at the airport waiting to go to the studio in Australia because Rajulia did not work in 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 in, in, in Bangkok. He only worked in. Um, so um, I said, we have a problem. What is it? He says, you, you'll see when you get here. So I go there and she says, he's lost a tremendous amount of weight since I first measured him months ago. So it turned out we know now that he had recently had a cancer operation. He had mm -hmm. been in the hospital recently and he looked ghastly. And I said, oh my, and he said, I'm going to have to pad his costume out. And I go, I said, I cannot photograph this guy like on Tuesday. So I said, we got to change the schedule. So I changed the whole schedule. I pushed all of his work to the end of the movie. All of his work to the end of the 10-week schedule, which, which w I guess would have been then he was working like the original plan, four weeks. He's going to last work the last month of the movie, the last three, maybe the last three weeks. And give him milkshakes, give him donuts, and, you know, uh, you know, get him, and he, he said he had recently had it, he said he'd gotten an intestinal virus, he lied, they lied to everybody, they said he got an intestinal virus working on a movie in, um, uh, in South America, where he played a, 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 a historical character, uh, a, a bishop who was fighting for indigenous rights, um, and uh, I, I was unable, because of the, the, the schedule, there was one day of work I could not push back, because of other, because of set being built, this, that, and the other thing, so the scene where he goes down to the laboratory and he sees Dalsim and says, "How's our experiments going, Doctor Dalsim?" That was that was. Uh, I had to film that early. He looks a little bit gaunt there, so I mm -hmm. filmed that. I had to film that, but then he did not work for a couple of weeks. But now, what am I going to film if I'm not filming all the dialogue scenes up front with Raul Julia? Now I had to throw the actors into these fight scenes, and they hadn't been properly trained. So uh, I was in a strange situation where. You're expecting some, you know, hand-to-hand -hand fighting in this movie, but a lot of it was a little sloppy because they did not have the time to train. At the end of the at the end of the day, when we assembled, put the movie together, we uh, ended up doing a week of reshoots. Uh, when we got back to back to America, um, where we uh, uh, amped up some of the, we we reshot uh, some of the material, particularly the fight at the uh, particularly the fight at the end of the movie uh, in the with um, Ken and Ryu. Uh, versus Zagat um, uh, and uh, Vega. Uh, that was filmed like the last week of the movie. And that's a, a pretty well choreographed fight. And you can see the guy, their skill level is up. And also the fight between Van Damme and Raul Julia was like the last days of filming um, uh, on the original shoot. And that's pretty well done. But a lot of the stuff before that is, is a little bit sketchy. I mean, um, the scene when... Um, uh, when um, uh, when uh, Balrog and uh, Honda are, uh, escape their prison cell, and the other, when the Ken and Ryu break them in, uh, that was the day that Van Dam like didn't miss his flight. And there was supposed to have been that scene was supposed to have been filmed about a week or so later, and there was supposed to be uh, a great little fight in that prison cell, like a claustrophobic fight between mm -hmm. these guys and some guards. You know, like inspired by, I guess, like the James Bond fight on the train or. Um, uh, in, in from Russia with Love, or the great fight in the elevator in in, uh, in Captain America: Civil War, uh, Winter Soldier. Yeah, yeah, like that's that's a whole thing to have a fight in a confined area. It's a it's a challenge. So we but we hadn't had time to rehearse it or practice it. So the the two guys just punched the guy in the in the, in the in the in the aisle. I mean, in the, in the corridor. It's like a joke. The guy turns around and he gets two. You know. So we had to make these these compromises on the action all along. It was very it was um, it was very frustrating. Uh, so, uh, uh, it, it's a miracle that we, you know, got the movie to come out and, uh, look as well as it did and to now have this reputation now where people love it. I was at a film festival, uh, in Spain, um, in January, it was a, it's a, a genre film festival. Um, and, uh, there's been a couple of these 30th anniversary screenings that I've been to and people go crazy for it. And a lot of people come up to me and say, I love it. And what it is, is there's a whole, um. I guess it's uh, not. I guess it's a Generation uh, X. It's, it's a, no, it's not. It, no, it's, it's Generation X, not Millennials. 
There's a whole bunch of people. This was the first action movie they saw. Like their parents, oh, and I'll let you, I'll let you see this one. It's PG-13. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of people in their mid-30s. This is one of their favorite pictures because it was the child, it was their, it was the picture that it was their first grown-up movie. Uh, you know? But, but another one that you were involved with that's had a lot of a complete uh, it was a one eighty uh, on the critical critical reaction is Judge Dredd. Like well, people love that one, though. Uh, no, uh, well, Judge Dredd, Judge Dredd was a str very strange bird. What's funny about that is I was a fan of the comic book when it was unknown in the United States, and I actually tried to get the guy who produced the movie to make that movie like in the eighties, and he said nobody knows this comic book. Uh, the, on Judge Dredd, the problem we had there is that um, the director, we had, we had a British director uh, who um, would always defend whatever he wanted to do as something from the comic book. So that script had been in development for about 12 years for many, many, many scripts. And I had developed a reputation as kind of a story doctor. I get brought in on pictures that are in trouble and to like fix the script. And sometimes I've even been a story um, uh, first responder, a movie first responder. The movie's finished. They had a test screening. The audience walked out, and I've been brought in on finished movies to like fix them and do reshoots and stuff. Nowadays on social media, there's always this gossip whenever that whenever that happens. Uh, the uh, uh, the social media is all over it. Uh oh, they're doing reshoots on this movie. They must be in trouble. Um, my experiences with this were like ten years ago or longer, so it sort of didn't get the the, the gossip. Uh, that you would, but I did that a lot. Um, so um, I came on this picture when they knew they wanted to make it, and they said, we have several scripts that had problems. Can you reconcile these scripts, take the best from, you know, so uh, I was doing a rewrite and pulling it together, and right away I see all these, like, things that are very, like, confusing. So at the first meeting I had with all the executives and the directors there, I go, my, I, my first question here is, I'll put this in terms for the Americans, I said in the room, why is Perry White the bad guy? And what do you mean? Now, Perry White, you know, is the, the editor of the Daily Planet. He's Lois Lane and Clark Kent's boss. He's mm. a, a mentor figure. He's like, um, he's like um, a Nick Fury in the Avengers movies. You know, he's the boss. So I go, why is he the bad guy? And so not a single person in the room knew that uh, that, that character that Jurgen Pruck now plays is a regular, ongoing mentor character to Judge Dredd. So that all the heads in the room turn around and look at the director. And he goes, uh, oh, I thought it was kind of a lock, you know. You kind of shock the audience. It felt, man, they trusted all these years. It's a bad guy. I said, but this one, they've never trusted him. They don't know who the hell he is. So they say, change him. So now he's, because he, he had these, he had these, he wanted to do these like world changing things. So another thing I come to in the script is the prison. Now, if you know the comic book, if you know 2000 AD, the prison is on Titan, a moon of Saturn. Mm. So I says, why is, okay, why is the prison Aspen, Colorado, when it's supposed to be in outer space? And there every head, and there, every head turns around. And he goes, oh, I thought kind of a lock, you know, Hollywood people, they go skiing in Aspen, and now in the future it's a prison. <laughs> and I go, but like, but like, like that? Why? Why would you? You know, there's fans of this comic book. You're pissing on two of the biggest things in the comic book. It's like saying Superman. It's your. It's like you're saying Superman's. You're saying Perry White's the bad guy, and Lex Luthor's a good guy, and Superman is not from Krypton. He's from Argon, I, or helium. I'm doing my noble <laughs> gas jokes. Uh, why? Are we, so fine. So they tell me. So they tell me as they rewrite the script, everything I bring up, this guy is done. Is that lightning? No, it's just the, the, the bulb flickered and it scared the shit out of me. Oh, oh you, you said there's a storm there, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's that way. All right. So in my script, I, 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 I undo all these bizarre little quirky things that, that are, you know, changing the canon. I don't know why. So um, nonetheless, when he got over to uh, the UK to start the movie, and remember, there's a tremendous time difference. He did a trick that other people have done who've been working in other time zones is he didn't do any of this stuff. So, for example, uh, he gets over there and he calls at this time. Caralco was uh, in financial troubles. In fact, they went bankrupt shortly thereafter. Uh, the uh, Cutthroat Island put, movie put them under. 
So he said, "Listen, I wanted to change the name of um, uh, of uh, the vil- of the judge who's a bad guy to to um, uh, I forget the name of the character in, in the comic, but it's they already made the signage, and it will cost over fifty thousand dollars to change the name of um, Jurgen Prochnow's character. So they're in a panic in L.A. about the cost of the movie. All right, never mind. Now, if you see the movie." His name is on his little tag, like in the military. Yeah. You know, and it's on the door of his office. Those are the only two places you can see the guy's name. So $50,000 was a complete lie. Right? Uh, the uh, outer, the, uh, the, the, the prison, right? The prison exterior is, it's in a cliff. You cannot tell where that cliff is. That cliff could be on Earth, it could be on Mars, it could be on Pluto, but he again said it's going to be at least $50,000 to change the prison to, to outer space. he just make up all this stuff to put these ideas back, which were just pissing on the comic book. It was just, I don't understand it at all to this day. But the fact that, but but in addition to these two, there were a dozen other issues that, in his mind, I won. The, it's about the movie. We're all supposed to be on the same side of the movie. Right, but there were a dozen other things that, that I said, and I prevailed, just on storytelling. And this annoyed the guy so much that if you see the movie again, you'll see the drunk driver in the flying car. He put on his license name to Souza. Stallone says, "Well, Mister De Souza, I don't care who you know. This is your third violation." And he blows his car up. That was his like. He, he went, that's why he got back at me. He made uh, uh, my character uh, uh, the name and. Um, on top of it, uh, he um, on the set he kept changing stuff. He actually tried to get writing credit on the movie for the for the things he did in the margins on the movie. Um, but the, uh, the the upshot here was he did, gave so many interviews um, before the movie came out about how terrible the script was that he finally had to rewrite the whole thing himself. That when the movie failed, he couldn't blame the script. So that was that thing. Um, but uh, you know, I do not. I did not want Sly to take his helmet off. You know, I, I didn't want to do that. That was, you know, they did that. I, I, I liked that. I also hated the you con- The first thing I said is I saw the sketches of the costume, and I go, are you kidding? You're doing like Batman with Adam West. You can't put the guy in, like, in, 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 in pajamas, in, in, in a leotard. Uh, do what do what, what uh, Tim Burton did in Batman. It should be body armor. And like, um, just yeah, the argument was, oh, the, the the fans they want it to look just like the comic book. I mean, the comic book costume makes zero sense. There's like, you know, there's like no armor except on your shoulders, and it's a big eagle. You know, it, it's it's. It, I did a movie that has a cult following now, called The Return of Captain Invincible, with uh, Christopher Lee and Alan Arkin. It's like pretty much like, um, um, it's like Hancock, but it was made like. You know, years ago, it was made 1982, and he has the, the eagles on his shoulder. And we did that as a joke, you know. Uh, so uh, the subsequent movie, just called Dread, uh, that had the costume right, in my opinion. Yeah. And he didn't take his helmet off in that movie, which was the way to go. Uh, uh, you, you've uh, uh, many times, both in press interviews and on Twitter, uh, confirmed that Commando 2 was not uh, Die Hard. No, never. But the the question I've got to ask is, uh, why was there no Commando 2? Well, um, what happened, I think, was that Arnold's uh, Arnold's, uh, career got so much momentum, and he's getting booked up so far ahead of time that uh, uh, he just moved away from it, you know? And, uh, you know, it was written, and you can find some old interviews with Arnold where he said he's going to make Commando 2 next year, uh, but he, he never got around to it. In fact, and somebody turned up an interview. The I did. There was a podcast the other day about. Um, um, I think I did something like this. I did a podcast interview about Commando um, the other day, and one of the people on it dug up some old interviews of Arnold. And Arnold said, "What are you thinking of doing next?" This is the, in the 1980s, and I said, "Well, I'm looking at doing Commando Two. I'm looking at doing Twins Two. Uh, I might do um, uh, uh, a Red Heat Two. And uh, they're, they're also talking about Terminator 2, but that's the one that looks least likely now. So ironically, that's the only one of those things that happened. Anyway, I think he just got booked up so fast 
that he wanted to move on. Now, recently, he's talked about doing it again. He's actually talked he might do it again. So in, in my draft, I had said that, uh, that um, for the purpose of the story, um, that if you accept the reality of the first Commander movie, he would have become famous after running all over Los Angeles, blowing stuff up, and then catching these, uh, the, 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 this, uh, uh, bringing justice to these uh, people who kidnapped his daughter. He would have had a moment in the sun. So I said that in the second picture, because of that celebrity that he got, that he went into private um, security business, uh, and that was where we meet him in the second story. And um, it was important in the second story, his important figure is a lawyer. And I said that Ray Dawn Chong had been going to law school while she was a stewardess. So she becomes his lawyer when he's falsely accused of a crime in the second picture. So if we did it today, we'd say that his daughter is the lawyer. It's an easy yeah. thing. Just get out my red pencil. Oh, I've been going to law school. Um, but uh, I, I, one of the things I'd love to ask you, because I've done the previous film guest, I've had a director, Alex Porres. I've yeah. had a writer, Guinevere Turner. She wrote the American Psycho. Uh, so the, the question I've always wanted to ask people like you and those two is, uh, uh, in regards to Die Hard, uh, what's it like having your name linked to a film? that's considered by so many to be one of the greatest ever? Uh, no, it's it's very flattering, you know, and uh, I guess it'll be on my tombstone, you know, at this point. Uh, do you think, uh, and this is probably just me reading too much into it, but do you think that Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber had as much to do with the popularity of Die Hard as Bruce Willis? Oh, absolutely. A absolutely. A, uh, a, uh, a protagonist, a hero is... Uh, is judged the arch you judge a hero by is his adversary the greater the villain the greater the hero i'll give you an example another one of my movies where not i but a subsequent writer uh with a gun to his head held in the hand of the star made the villains in hudson hawk completely silly completely silly and i believe that one of the reasons that movie failed probably the principal movie that failed when it first came out, is the villains were so silly, you never really worried that they were a threat, and there was no doubt that the hero would prevail. Yeah. Now, even a, and I know it's a comedy, but even a Disney movie, a Disney movies are all comedies, right? Let's take a movie like Aladdin, the animated Aladdin. There's talking fucking animals. There's the bird. There's the, Gilbert Gottfried's the bird, he says, uh, Jafar, they're, they're, they're on to us, we gotta get out of town. They're, come on Quiet, you cowardly chicken. Soon all Arabia will be under my control once I marry the princess. You know, he's serious. <laughs> Scar in The Lion King, who's the villain, who plays Hans Gruber's brother later, right? He's deadly serious. It's a critical, fatal mistake to have a silly cartoon villain. Now, Alan Rickman is quite funny in Die Hard. He's quite funny. He gets big laughs. But he's scary and serious. You, you know, uh, in my opinion, because I was talking about this the other day in the pub, is that uh, for me, that if you don't get Alan Rickman as Hans Gruber, then you don't get Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. Because even though one's a villain, one's a hero, they've still got that sort of, I, I like your sort, I had to prove myself. You know, and it's like, it's the same character. Yeah, well, I, I would, I would, I would amend your theory there. Um, at the, it's it's well known that when they when we went uh, to make Die Hard, Die Hard is as some as many people know is a sequel to a picture to a, a picture that was made with Frank Sinatra called The Detective. The same author wrote wrote these two books. One uh, about an old middle aged cop, and then the second book he was retired. So Sinatra was already in his forties played the John McClane character in the movie The Detective. And his estranged wife was played by Faye Dunaway, who at that time is cancer, which is why she's dead in the second book. Yeah. So contractually, 20th Century Fox had to offer the part to, to Sinatra, the, you know, initially. And fortunately, he said, I'm too old and too rich, you know, to take this picture, which is good. Because the chases in the building would have been on rascal scooters, <laughs> taking, the, taking the part. But then they went to the obvious suspects. They went to Stallone. They went to Schwarzenegger. 
They went to uh, Richard Gere. They went to uh, James Caan, who I know I'm friendly with. He regret to this day. He said no. They, uh, the, the director, uh, the producer, Larry Gordon, had a long-standing relationship with Burt Reynolds. He went to Burt Reynolds. They went to everybody in Hollywood, right? And then in desperation, because the movie had a release date, they went to Bruce Willis. And, and then, of course, knowing that they had exhausted every other possibility, Bruce Willis's agents asked for an astronomical price, which they got, which was $5 million, which was... And I know that's the thing today, but five, believe me, $5 million was a lot of money, and, uh, especially for someone who was not considered a movie star. He's a uh, television star. He had had two movies prior that had failed. Um, so the next day, um, Richard Dreyfuss fired his agent. He said, I don't get $5 million, and I have an Academy Award. You're fired. So it, it made everybody's price, all the stars, the prices went up uh, as a result of that. But what happened was, what made that, and the reason they all turned the part down, by the way, is you got to put it in context. At this time, this is 1988. At this time, after a lot of movies, and I'm a culprit here, with Stallone and Schwarzenegger and um, um, Van and um, Van Damme, and then you had Chuck Norris and um, uh, Dolph Lundgren. You had these giant, you know, uh, uh, you know, oak-like muscle men as the heroes, and Bruce is just a normal-looking guy, right? Mm. And so with these kind of heroes, Stallone in Rambo, the commies, it's always commies in those days before the Berlin Wall. We're going to be back to commies again, I think. But it was always commies. The, com the commies grab Stallone in Rambo, and they tie him to the bed springs of a mattress. Remember? That's, they, they're, all the ticking, all the fabric is out. It's just the giant springs. And then they put electrodes on his gonads. Right, and they're beating him with clubs, and they're giving him electric shocks. He breaks free. He kills everybody in the room. Then he goes over and he grabs the microphone because he knows the main bad guy is elsewhere, and he says, "I'm coming after you next." <laughs> now this is the complete opposite of Bruce Willis hearing gunshots, looking out the door of the bathroom, and seeing a dozen Germans come in. With, like, you know, battlefield weapons. And he looks at them, he looks at his pistol, and he runs upstairs to try and, you know, find a phone. This is before everybody had a telephone. So that is the point on the script, in my opinion, that every actor said, fuck this. This guy's a pussy. <laughs> I really think that, I, I, because it was so contrary to what had been established the previous decade. And but the, the proof that that was the moment came from my young son. At this time, my children, I had small children, they had seen my TV shows, but they never seen my movies because they were all R-rated. Yeah. So finally I said, all right, he's 11, he can probably handle this. Um, so, um, and, and what I would show them is, after we'd finish a movie like Commando, we'd have to make a version for television and airlines, where you take out the cursing. Like, yippee ki yay melon farmer, you know that kind of thing, <laughs> right, right, you know that. <laughs> Right? You don't talk about it. All right, so uh, they had only seen my movies on a VHS tape. They didn't see it in the movie theater, where it was, you know, less gruesome. So at this moment, when Bruce Willis looks outside, looks at his gut, and runs upstairs, my 11-year-old son grabs my arm and says, Dad, you're a hero's chicken shit. So I go, where did you learn that word? Not from my movies. And the first time I ever seen Die Hard, it was shown here... At seven o'clock in the afternoon, and anything adult was censored out, and it was fifty minutes long. Ah. And I remember saying to my mum, "This is awful. What is this?" So she went and rented me out the video for it, ah. and I and I was just like, "Holy fuck, I've changed!" You know. But I have to ask you, what's your take on Bruce Willis saying that Die Hard isn't a Christmas film because that's insane? Oh, it's absolutely a Christmas film. I can I can prove it. I have a um I can't I can't go get it and hold it up for you now, but um I assume you have a website or a blog or something that goes along with your show. Yeah, yeah. You have something, all right. I'll send you a chart. I made a chart that proves incontestably with graphics that it, it, it's a Christmas movie. Now a lot of people every Christmas it goes around. They I, I get called for interviews. Um, um, a television station comes here with a camera. Um, is it a Christmas movie? And there's always people. So one guy always says it can't be a Christmas movie because it came out in 
July. And which I respond, I send them, if it's on Twitter, I send them the actual poster for Miracle on 34th Street, which is the Uber Christmas movie, you know, with the little, you know, the black and white movie where it, this, this department for Santa Claus turns out to really be Santa Claus. You, you know the film, right? Oh, yeah. It's, all right. So uh, young Natalie Wood is the little girl. That movie came out in June. So that argument. And by the way, what's really funny is because it came out in June, and, and, and this is like 1949, I think, they're saying, gee, with Christmas movies coming out in June, how do we promote this? It'd be funny if we promoted the Christmas movie. So they, if you see the original coming attractions, which are on internet, it's, it's shown as a romantic comedy. There's no, you don't know it's a Christmas movie at all from the coming attraction. So people went into seeing it's a romantic comedy and were surprised it took place at Christmas. So that's the number one argument. It doesn't have to come out at Christmas. But um, it's undoubtedly a Christmas movie. And uh, I, could go, I, could go, I could go through my in, entire list right now of why it's a Christmas movie. But uh, maybe you want to see the chart instead. I wish there was a way to send you the chart. I could probably email you the chart now. Anyway, I'll do it when we get off. But it's uh, a Christmas movie, of course. And, and just as uh, I come to the final question, because you've given me uh, a lot of your time here. Uh, Die Hard Six is apparently in the works now. There's now, as much as I love the whole franchise, especially the first one, the first four I think are all brilliant. But uh, with Die Hard Six in the works and with Bruce Willis not exactly being, you know, in the shape he used to once be, uh, if it was up to you, how would you do uh, Die Hard Six? Well, uh, I disagree with you that, that uh, on all of them. In my opinion, only the first two are, in my opinion, are diehard movies. My definition of a diehard movie is, number one, it is a classic Aristotelian uh, 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 model of unity of time, place, and action. This is Aristotle's rules for dramatists. Time, place, and action are all unified. It takes place in a compressed time, dusk to dawn, 12 hours, Time, place, and action are all together. Uh, so, uh, and addition, additionally, the hero is caught in the space of eyes, of eyes, of, uh, of, eyes of the, the skill and carbides of the, the villains and the authorities, and neither one of them wants him there. And they both work against him. He has no help. He's trapped in a claustrophobic space he cannot get out of, and everyone is against him. The first two movies, which I worked on, meet those requirements. Unity of time, place, and action. Trapped. Both authorities and villains don't want you there and work against you. In the third movie, he is no longer trapped. Right? And the authorities are helping him. He also is no longer alone. The first two movies alone, he has a buddy. Now, the, everybody knows the third picture was a different movie altogether called Simon Says, and they said, all right, let's call it Die Hard. I was asked to do the third movie, and they said, we have this existing script. Can you turn it into uh, a Die Hard picture? And I, I had began to, I had a meeting, and uh, they were going, I was going to do it, but I had a contractual obligation at Paramount, so I couldn't get away from it, so I ended up not doing it. And then the fourth and fifth movies, after the third movie, the producers I had worked with, Larry Gordon and Joel Silver, uh, they sold the rights to, uh, to uh, Caraco. And now the rights have been sold yet again. So I don't know any of the people making the subsequent movies. Now, by the time you get to the, so the third movie, he's not only trapped, not only not trapped, not only not alone, not only not fighting the authorities, uh, but he has mobility. He goes all over Manhattan, and in the end, he goes to Canada. The, the fourth movie, the, not only are the police helping him, but so are the FBI and the CIA. And he has computer hackers helping him. Yeah. And, he's, and he's driving all over the eastern seaboard, from Washington, D.C. to New York, and I think they go to Boston, I'm not sure. And then the next picture, he's, he's in Russia. Now they make him PG-13 movies, so we have to say yippee ki Melon Farmer, or yippee ki an explosion goes off, in the first two movies, I made him a technophobe. He's a technophobe who's scared to fly. 
Now he's flying all over. He's flying helicopters. He's a superhero. What the, the greatest compliment I got on the first picture, people came up to me after the first movie came out and said, that was great. I really thought Bruce was going to die. And it's hard for you, for you uh, uh, young people, you kids today, to realize that actually movie stars used to die in movies. John Wayne died in movies. Frank Sinatra in uh, Von Ryan's Express, he gets all the Allied prisoners out of the prison camp, but he is killed as they escape. Paul Newman frequently died in his movies. He would win, but he would die. So I'm, if I'm trying to think of a, of a recent like Hollywood movie where the hero died, uh, I can think of Gladiator. It's the only one I can think of, honestly. Mm. So the fact that in 1988, somebody said, I thought the hero was going to die, showed what a good job we did of building the suspense. Now, once you do the sequel, you go, okay, I guess I'm not going to think he's going to die again. So in the sequel, in order to get that vulnerability back, that's why I had him try and stop the plane from crashing and fail. Because mm. after that moment, he's a broken man. You know, because he, you know, so he, he had to get the vulnerability. But now he's a super, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a superman. He's like, um, uh, he's unstoppable. And uh, he, even the actor, you know, we talked about this in the first two pictures. Well, he, you, know, you got to show fear. But they're not doing that much anymore. So in my opinion, after the first two, it sort of lost the, uh, it lost the ground rules of a diehard movie as far as I'm, my opinion goes. And um, as I said, the third movie and the fourth movie began as other movies entirely. Um, and the fifth movie was written from scratch as a diehard movie. But by that time, whatever the ground rules of a diehard movie were had been sort of lost over the past 20 years, and it's just a generic action movie. And uh, for the record, I also consider Die Hard 2 to be a Christmas film. Yeah, well, thank you, but I think not so much as the first one. I mean, the first one, I can tell you, like, uh, uh, here, here, here's what I would compare it to. Now, Miracle on 34th Street is certainly a, uh, the, 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 one of the great Christmas movies, but another one that's incontestably a Christmas movie is White Christmas. Mm. Right? You know, it beats a uh, musical Big Crosby, Danny K. So, does the movie take place during the Christmas holiday? Die Hard takes place entirely during the Christmas holiday. White Christmas, only the first scene and the last scene take place on Christmas. The rest of the movie, it, the movie covers a five or six year period. It starts at the end of World War II, and then it picks up in the 1950s. So we only have two scenes of Christmas versus the whole movie. Die Hard wins. Point, Die Hard. The setting of the movie is a Christmas party. Die Hard is entirely a Christmas party, the whole movie. White Christmas, only the last scene is a Christmas party. Advantage, Die Hard. How many Christmas songs are in the movie? Die Hard has four. Let It Snow, Winter Wonderland, Christmas and Hollis is the one they play in the limousine, and Jingle Bells. White Christmas only has two. White Christmas, which is sung twice, and Snow. And Snow is arguably just a winter song, but we'll give it a pass. It's a Christmas song. So now again, advantage, Die Hard. The party venue becomes threatened. What is the threat of the party movie in Die Hard? Terrorists. What is the threat of the party venue in White Christmas? Foreclosure. So you have like terrorists, bankers. Advantage Die Hard. There's a broadcaster with a hidden agenda. In Die Hard, it's Dick Thornburg. Right? He's yeah. going to, he'll bring everybody down. Right? The broadcaster with a hidden agenda in White Christmas is Johnny Grant. He's going to help them have a surprise party. Not quite the same hidden agenda. The German ringleader in Die Hard is Hans Gruber. The German ringleader in White Christmas is Hitler. Okay, baby advantage, White Christmas. Government incompetence. The government incompetence that leads to mis mischief in Die Hard is the FBI overreacts. In White Christmas, it's the Pentagon fires General Waverly, which is the precipitates the plot. The body count. This is where I lose people. Die Hard, 23 people get killed. In White Christmas, 26,128 people are killed in the Battle of the Bulge, which is the opening of the scene. The opening <laughs> is the Battle of the Bulge, the, the, the uh, German counter. Now, this is where someone says, well, you can't count them. They're all killed off camera. 
you know, only you know, only uh, Danny K is injured, like from a uh, uh, from a uh, shrapnel. So I go, okay, is is Ellis dead and die hard? Well, of course, he's killed off camera. So there goes that argument. Uh, finally, what is the gift of the Magi like selfless scrap sacrifice? You you know that story, the gift of the Magi, the uh, American. So okay, uh, she cuts her beautiful. There, there's a poor couple. She cuts her long beautiful hair to buy him a chain for his watch. And he sells his watch to buy her a comb for her hair. The gift of the beautiful sacrifice. What is the beautiful sacrifice one does for a loved one in Die Hard? Bruce Willis runs barefoot over broken glass. What is the gift of the Magi-like selfless sacrifice in White Christmas? Danny Kay gives his first class ticket to, to Vera Ellen. It just doesn't compare. So I think it's incontestable. Die Hard wins on every point of Christmas movie. Listen, uh, Mr. D'Souza, I just want to thank you so much for your time. Uh, this is uh, brilliant. I can't wait to show off about this, but can I ask one favor from you? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, my other podcasting job is I edit for this sports show called Keeping the 100, and one of the guys on that show is a wrestler, or a retired wrestler called Disco Inferno. Uh, he has said that his favorite a uh, film many many times he talks about it and drops one liners here and there is Die Hard so can I have a request from you the writer to ask him to stop watching it <laughs> uh, what's okay so you say it's uh, disco disco fever what, what disco, <laughs> disco inferno oh oh just just go here all right disco inferno give Die Hard a rest thank you very much thank you